for the start. Uh, so we will hear to Robin Hoffman. Uh, I think I'm going back to the machine that's uh, looking Legos. I always wanted to work something like it, so let's see what happens. Yeah, so here the animal is, and fingers crossed it will do something sensible. Uh, we'll find out. So, um, I don't know if either of you have seen me speaking at um, other conferences, but there, uh, the general plot, the way we operate things is that uh, they, they have some sort of theme of things running for conferences. I find a way to, to fit in there and then three slides into the thing, I start talking about Erlang. And it, it works wonders. And er Erlang is a solution for all, just about anything. The problem is, you see these nice people? We, we learned from Bodle today, this is how enterprise people look like. And these are enterprise Java people. And then when you go into a conference like QCon, I went in there and I, I didn't realize it was a Java conference because I didn't do my homework. So um, I ran on stage and I asked them, anybody using Java for a living? And hands go up and I'm okay, that's a lot of people here, this is going to be fun. So I said, see this, put this on your arm, it'll make the pain of Java go away. <laughs> and, and, and as normally, they turn into this. <laughs> Stark raving orcs. So then we have another thing here uh, because this is pictures of nice Erlangers. The community here, nice people, everything. And then you, you get the idea and you talk about it on the mailing list and, and you suggest slightly, in a, in a parenthesis almost, maybe I will use Elixir to teach kids how to program. And then the Erlangers, they turn into this. <laughs> All right, it's been a year, so maybe things have changed. So the, the question now is, is anybody here using Erlang for a living? Yeah, good. I have these patches for you. <laughs> I, you can put them on here. It'll take the pain of Erlang away. <laughs> so jokes aside, but there's something here because other people have been talking about this. The syntax and all of this really, truly is irrelevant unless you're doing brain fog, and then it's a different thing. But that's beyond uh, normal uh, things here. What matters is thinking. Again, I could go on for hours about how universities do not teach young people how to think anymore, but we will leave that for a beer later. But thinking in is everything. And what, what does it mean to think? It's the language you have that shapes your thinking. In language, in this case, it's not your programming language, it's not if you speak French, it's not if you speak Danish or Swedish or whatever, it's the concepts you talk about. That's important, because that's your language, and that is what's limiting you in expressing things. And this is what happens when you have an object-oriented programmer, and you tell him, you can no longer use an object, you have to use a process. He will need to go to a shrink for weeks. If it's a girl, same thing. They are uh, like that. So that means that language actually is everything. So that's a good thing to remember. Language is everything. Good. So that's that said. So now you've been warned. There will be Elixir in this talk uh, there, and there will be Lego. So the first encounter I had with with this Mindstorm thing here, uh, not this particular set because that's the Stockholm Office one, was in Legoland in 2008. They had a huge demo room, and then I told my wife, I'll just go in and try this out with my son. I'll only do the trying out. And she looks at me, really? Yes, I'll be not be buying anything. You, you know, you, you make promises and everything uh, there. So, um, so I went in and uh, we had this father-son moment. <laughs> and, and, and evidently it, it stuck a bit harder with me because last week I did this presentation and I had my son in the audience in London and I asked him just to make sure that this really came through as a wonderful moment and everything. Do you remember? And he said, no, not really. <laughs> it goes to show when you have a teenager, you need to rehearse things with them. Very. <laughs> so anyway, it was a father-son moment. They had a beautiful environment. You, you took this mindstorm and you were sitting there and you were building visual programming and everything. It was just wonderful. So I just went out there, didn't look at the wife, just went straight to the booth and bought a Lego mindstorm set. And uh, later I had to buy her back to recover from that, but uh, never mind, you fix it. And then we come home, and then I'm expecting this again, because this is cool, this is what you want to do with your kids uh, there. And then I turn into this. Because it turns out that the environment they show you in the, the demo room is a demo environment. 
it's shielding you from all the nastiness of the lab view graphical environments that ships with the Lego Mindstorm. And I'm sitting there, and my son goes, Dad, can we get it to work? Mm, no, no, we can't. Dad, do Dad doesn't understand this. Dad doesn't understand visual sequential programming. And it was just horrible. So, luckily enough, I sold it off with a profit, because I'd bought it in Legoland and I got a discount and everything. So I avoided having to buy another bag for my wife for selling it, so uh, that was good. Pro then, 2013, my son goes, ah! I think I'd like a Lego Mindstorm kit. And in my head, whoo, father son moment again. This is going to be great. So we buy a new set. Not on discount, but this time it was on his Christmas wish list, so it didn't involve another bag. So I was, I was cool. This is good. And then we open up the thing and we start the visual environment. And this is the feeling the same pain again. And I couldn't explain these things, even though time has passed. It was the same monstrous pain of programming. Try the environment one day, and you will understand what it is. So, we, after a few tries, we put it away, and then you had this 3,000 corner, uh, Danish corner thing sitting there, not doing anything, just reminding you this is the b most expensive Christmas present you've ever bought to your son, and he's not using it. And that was close to another bag, but uh, then I thought, okay, I'll start doing something. So I took out Elixir, and I told my wife, I'm going to do some magic stuff, don't disturb me. And then I did some, um, some hacking and did some things to get Elixir running on this one. And uh, then we're actually getting closer, because then, uh, after doing a few drivers, I took my son in into the room and said, see son, you need to see some code here. And then he goes, oh. I can understand this code. And it's Elixir code, and it's oh, and he said, oh, good, you can understand it. There. Then he said, okay, that's it. Then do something with it. So he copied a few lines, changed a few things, that worked fine. Then he did some extra things, and then he compiled it, and then the ugly animal of uh, error messages in Elixir crept out of things and then blah, screaming at him, and he ran away. So my conclusion of this is that Elixir fits when you can program a bit. So I'm assuming you all guys here can program a bit. Uh, there, so we can skip the thing about learning Elixir. I'll come back to that later. So there are things involved in, in, in trying to get this to run. So first of all, there's this Linux distribution called ev3dev.org, uh, which will put Linux on an SD card. And then when you have that on, on the thing, you connect to it, you install Erlang, which is actually quite easy. You just do apt get install Erlang, and then you unzip a pre-compiled Elixir, and you're up and running. And be warned, it's not super fast. It's rather slow. But still, you have Elixir running. Everything is good. And then, of course, since it's Elixir, and since it's a, a Linux thing, you need to do some alchemy. And in this case, it's file alchemy you, you need to do. And now, I'll just one second, I'll turn this on, because booting also takes a time uh, there. So the thing is, it has a file-based interface. So everything you want to do to control the motors and the sensors has to go, go through a file. And then if you take them and then pop them in with a, with a wire uh, there, they'll show up uh, in the file system. So when you connect the motor, you can see it here, sys class tacker motor, motor zero. And that means it's the first motor you've connected to the system. If you take the motor out and put it back in, it goes up to motor one just to have fun in the file system uh, there. And then you open it up and you go in and you have this in your file system and you go, hmm, there's a lot of files. What am I to do with this? Luckily, this is documented on re ev3dev.org. And by the way, I'll say something more about this. This is not how it looks today. I, I know out of painful experience, the new ev3 totally changes the file system uh, there. But anyway, so what can you do? Well, you take the duty cycle SP file and you write a number between minus 100 and 100, which is if you want to go forward fast or backward fast and something in between. And then you write a 1 to the run file and the engines will just go beautiful. So that's, that's okay. And you can do that on the command line and you can do things there, but then it's not really programming. It's just hacking around with hardware uh, there. So then... Uh, we did a, this library thing, and uh, Jimmy is here. Uh, he did this, and he wrote some beautiful macros 
uh, that takes away all this pain of defining things you can actually write to and having an interface to all these files. And here he's, he's defining, we have run here, he says it's writable, it has a min and a max value uh, there, and you've got some other things uh, you can set, which is really nice, a super nice interface to this. And then it allows you to write, and this is, for me, this was the first time I saw macros that made sense, because I'm old style, so, and I'm not a Lisp person, so uh, macros are a little bit scary. So here you have a way of actually uh, getting something from a port, and then you can see here you can turn it in and you have some utility functions here, and then after you've read the thing, you then turn it into an integer or an atom. And then you have all of this just magically generated for you using macros, no boilerplate code. <laughs> Super, because then, aha! You can just tell the, the, the motor, I want you to go forward, the one connected to output port B with 50, and the other one forward with uh, strings 30, and I can read the color sensor. This, and if, if, if you're like me, this is actually getting close to beautiful code, and then you start feeling like this. And then again, you're sitting there spinning in your, your little office and everything is good uh, there. I, I work at home, so it's okay for me to sit and spin. It, it doesn't disturb anybody. Uh, and then at this point, in normal slides here, uh, show me some Lego, which we will do in a few seconds. I'll just warn you here, because this is how I feel right now. Um, because normally I don't do live demos. I'm scared to death uh, by doing live demos, but um, people have convinced me it is a good idea, which I did last week in London, and it failed. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so maybe you want to see this. Uh, good, we'll mirror the displays here for a second. Good. And it's on. And it's, yep. Oh, we'll put it down here. Oh, just, we can just explain it here, how it works. So, we have two motors here, driving these two wheels. And then we have a color sensor here uh, that is trying to read something and then turn that into something we can actually use to steer the thing with. And then it's got a bumper up here front, but uh, we'll check that later. And uh, it's got a tail too, artistic impressions, but we're not going to do that today. Uh, yeah, so let's put this down. There we go. And then we connect here. Let's see. Uh, I can't spell. It's Java Rocks, and it's so difficult to, to, to spell. Ah, there we go. Oh, good. Ah, the password is, of course, Elixir, but yeah. So now you can steal my SD card. Uh, yeah. Good. And uh, let's see. Yeah, it resets the date every time you restart it. It's beautiful. One second. Uh, yeah. Working with embedded stuff always is funny. Repeat after me. Working with embedded stuff is always funny. Good. So good. And now IEX minus S mix. First, we need to get Erlang running. Erlang is a resource hawk. It's just going in there, <coughs> stealing all the CPU power, and you can almost feel the batteries getting hot over here, uh, there. And then, then we put Elixir on top of that just to make sure that uh, we take anything, everything out of this one. Yeah. Just give it a few seconds. You can't blame me for doing false uh, commercials here. You'll see how it really is. Uh, there, you don't won't, won't you won't be going home and see. Oh, it just works. No, it takes a little bit of patience here. So, good, ready, and yeah. Sometimes it fails like that. Don't 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 despair. We start again. Yes. See? It's following the line. 
For those who can't see, just trust it. But it, it's actually following the line. And it's, it, it's using a very clever algorithm. It's, it's following the left edge of the dark line. Because then it can do, and we, we can go into some of how the, how the steering works on that and, and the philosophy behind that. Let's see how confused it gets when it reaches the end of this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and it thinks it found a line uh, there. Yeah, poor thing, but we'll put it out of its misery now. Uh, and actually, no, no, let me just show you something. Let me just show you something. Let's see, we, we're safety cautious here. So this was a bumper. So when it bumps into something, it actually stops. So it has a safety feature. So no Legos were hurt in this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Thank you. Yeah, and that will of course be the last time in my life a live demo has ever worked. So, but we'll just savor the moment for a second. Good. Anyway. So I feel a little less like this guy right now, uh, there. So then this has, of course, been coded in a very uh, elixir way, a beamster way uh, of, of programming it. But let's go through the different stages of how to approach this uh, and do these things. So a naive pr approach to program this, even if you're in, in elixir and you're just coming to the thing there, would be that you take one process to be the controller. And then you have a timer to trigger this process to go read off the sensors. And then you change the motor settings. And then the problem with that one is it has no leverage of processes. And that means that this way of structuring your program is a bad fit for what Elixir and Erlang is about. It's about processes and message passing. So if you're doing this, you're programming the thing as if you were doing Python. Then by all means, stay in Python. Do not take a sip of the divine water called Elixir and Erlang. Don't do it. Stay away uh, there. But if you want to do this, you have to do something. And that comes down to the golden trinity of Erlang, which applies to Elixir as well uh, there. So these are the things. I took a walk one day because you think better when you walk. Anybody who claims to be thinking while sitting in front of a computer screen, that person is lying. Simply, you need to walk to think. Anyway, so the things I would never remove from Erlang, um, because if they remove some of this, I'll be running screamingly away from it, and I'll also be running screamingly away from Elixir, because then it's not magic anymore. Uh, this is the act of divine intervention that came to the uh, computer science lab uh, many years ago, 25 years ago, at least. Uh, so it's share nothing, fail fast, and failure handling. These things, and the way they fit together, this is why you are here today. This is why there's still something called Erlang, and there's also something called Elixir. The way these things work together, this is, how th this is the magic. And this is what you need to embrace in your coding in order to, to, to taste the magic and to live forever. So, so that's what you need to do. So what you do here is, let's say we take a sensor and make a proxy for each sensor by being one process. Now we're, now we're talking, right? So. All these reading timers to, to, to trigger, for instance, reading the, the color sensor. Uh, by the way, I need to turn this off, otherwise it will do some nasty things to me. Go off uh, there. So the sensor there, all that reading, you can configure that inside the process that acts as a pro uh, proxy for this uh, color sensor, meaning you can control how often you want to read it depending on what you want to do. So all of that is just abstracted away. And then you can have it the, the sensor here just send a message back to your control process when there's a change in value. So now you get into something that's event-driven, which is good. It's a good fit. And then you feel like a beamster. That's my word for being either an Erlanger or a, an alchemist. It's a beamster uh, there. So that's good. And the way that looks then in code is, and it's OK to take out a Kleenex and, and wipe out uh, eyes because uh, your eyes when it, it gets really nice here. I, I, I get tears in my eyes when I see nice code, so uh, it's OK. Uh, no, no pointing fingers over that. So here, you have this thing. You, you read the color uh, off here. Then you do a bit of monkling to figure out if, if it has changed uh, sufficiently. Uh, there, you're taking uh, all, all same and blah, blah, blah. And then should you have a change in color, you notify the line follower, the brain of your system, that, good, we have a new color here, uh, there. And then you continue, you repeat, and then you do uh, 
since this is inside a DNFSM, you do a no reply because it was a message you got, and then you're just sending yourself another check with that interval you've set when you, you want to read the color. This is how easy code should be. So this one is separated, there's a color sensor, it's doing its own life. And then we can ask also the bumper, you saw the bumper in action, and that is actually quite easy, because when the bumper uh, feels that it has a value of pressed, it will just notify the, the, uh, the line follower that the bumper has hit something. And then it's up to the controller to figure out to do with this bumper hit. And then it'll check again if it has hist hit anything uh, there. So it's again read sensor, notify the controller, and repeat the whole thing. So you do these nice little abstractions for each of the little uh, components in your hardware thing. And then we come to where, where, where I'm, when I'm sitting here, the first time I did that, I was crying like a baby because this is so beautiful. Um, so you have a color sensor here, and you draw that as a circle because it's, it's a process. And then you have the controller. And then you're sending a message to that. And the beautiful thing here is that then this color sensor, you can barely see it, but there's a wire here going here somewhere. There, and that wire equates the message passing between the two processes. So the software architecture resembles the physical architecture of what you're doing. Go find that in a Java program, please. Can't do that. And then, of course, the beauty just goes on and on. So you have your motors here and you're just sending commands to them, and again, they're connected by wires to your control. So everything's adding up. And then, because these things are simple, we just add another process, the bumper, and that will be connected again by another wire, and it'll send a bumper hit in. So this is just one-to-one -one match between physical and uh, conceptual software architecture. It doesn't get any better than this, simply. Not in this slideshow, anyway. So, so the line follower, we've seen it, it follows the left edge of the line, uh, there, and it's implemented as GenFSM, and it has a number of little small functions uh, to control the motors. And I'll show a little bit of the code here. So here, it'll, f let's see, whoop, whoop, whoop. let's call this the line right now. So if it's on the left side of the line, it'll say, ah, now I need to drive forward slightly right until I find the line again. So that's the logic here. I'll just do that. And the forward slide right um, is, of course, that you tell the left engine to run a little faster than the right engine and then you curve to the right uh, there and then you wait on here till until you see the target color you're looking for that's of course the color of the line and that's why we have a black color down there because describing what the Erlang solutions logo look like as one color is a little difficult uh, there so you see as soon as you find that you say now I'm on the right side of the edge and that means I need to then do the opposite thing and start turning a little bit left. And that's why you saw the robot going It was not drunk, it was just trying to find a line ever so simply. And then, this is pretty good, and then you go to the all state events, and this is like the bumper hit, or if you just ask the thing to stop. And the bumper hit here is when you get that event in, you stop all the motors and all the event generators, that's all your sensors here, and you just terminate this uh, state uh, SF FSM here. So this is also very nice. There. Other things you can do there where it gets even more nice is that if you have the time to do that, I haven't had so far, you can protect the hardware. Because that's process, that's not the sensor, that's, you can't do anything to protect that or harm that uh, there. But the motors, if you, you give them the signal to go back and forth all the time, very fast, you'll break motors. That's just the way these things are. They are very sturdy. Lego has made some really good stuff, but they are still, despite being a Danish company, the biggest uh, toy company in the world, they are still have to obey the laws of physics. So they, they still have to uh, adhere to that. So those motors can be damaged there. But the thing is here, yeah, you can create that process for your, for your motor. You can build into that, that you'll control, that you're not going outside its, its uh, safety limits. And that's a nice thing you can do with this. Try coding this in your no, normal loop. No, this is a thing that's a property of that motor. It has to go inside the abstraction for the motor there. As you saw, reaction to the bumper, fairly easy there. And then you also got this smoothing of sensor readings by reading and reading. And it was inside the process. It was inside the color sensor that we did that smoothing. Nothing on the outside. We just decided this is an abstraction we're building, and it's quite easy to do. Good. Now. The problem here is, well, 
problem, problem. There are those people here that, um, can we do it a little bit more direct? So this involved fuddling around with Linux. And it also f meant fuddling around with these SD cards. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but SD cards, they break when you least expect them to do, do it so. Like last week when I was supposed to present in London, it broke down in the morning of the day of the presentation. So I had to find a new card. So it's good. Yeah. People like that, I will not comment on that uh, there. Uh, because what I think my main goal is, I would like to write some control software. All this fun, fun stuff of putting Linux on an SD card uh, and getting Erlang on it and getting Elixir on it, and then every time you've done a change to your file that you copy them over and then yeah, get it all compiled there again. Yeah, that fun, yeah, sort of fun. But I would like just write some control software. So what if we can just run that control software from the laptop? That would be nice because then my, my feedback cycle becomes extremely short. If, and if I'm particularly clever about it, I could probably write the software over here, run it on my computer, and control it over there, and, and, and then if I want to do really embedded stuff, I could probably just get it over there and run over there. But I want the feedback in my, my programming to be fast and have it here. Luckily, Lego has created something called direct commands, which means that you pull out the SD card here with the Linux on it, and then you just boot the normal software, and then you can send commands to control all the sensors and motors using uh, these commands, and it's over Bluetooth or Wi-Fi uh, there. And then you can run whatever program you want to control the thing on your own machine, speeding up development time, speeding up the feedback loop, and making everything uh, good. And then, if you're an old telecom guy like me, then again, Kleenex out, because we have these instructions here with opcodes and arguments and how encoding and everything, and it gets even better. <laughs> it gets even better. Because then you get to the command encoding. And then you, and when you're sitting around people that actually try to do this in Java and have done it, and they're just crying over this shit because oh, it's not doable. And this kind of thing, okay, they, will, they cry and I just look at it and go, yes, I know exactly what to do here. So what you do is you write a simple function for it. So you take in something here, a command type, the command, some options to it, and then at the end of the day, let's forget about this for a second, you just say, ah, byte size of the command I'm sending, plus five, because that's the header here, and that has to be encoded in 16 bits, little engine encoded. <sighs> it's, a, it's okay to cry now. <laughs> it's, uh, and then you have the message counter here, the same thing here, and you have some bytes coming here, and then here's, here's the extra beauty. I only need six bits for this alloc local thing, and I only need two bits for this one. This, three or four classes in Java to get this shit done. <laughs> lovely, lovely. Of course, we're cheating a little bit here because you also have to have use some of these underlying parameter encoding functions. But then again, this is also good. Depending on the size of this numeric um, variable we were trying to encode, that different ways of encoding it. So the first one is interesting because it's for the, when it's less than 32, you can do this one where you put in a short format, which of course is one bit. Ah, lovely. And you tell us the constant afterwards, also one bit, and then the size comes here in the last remaining six bits. Go home, do this in C, and uh, lose your hair. It's, uh, I've never done this in C, I still have my hair. So <laughs> there you go. And then, if, of course, if it gets longer, you tell it it's a long format, constant, constant value, and magic, there needs to be a zero, feeling two bytes, uh, bits here. I have no idea about that. Did you figure that out, Jimmy? That is a mystery, yeah. This has to be a little bit of alchemy even in, 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 in encoding here. And then again, the in value itself here, the last eight bits. This is nice. Okay, so. Yeah, maybe it is. Yeah, okay. that could be a reminiscence from that uh, you would like to have something uh, byte aligned that you put in there, some padding there. Because nobody except uh, people doing over the air protocols will have something that's not byte aligned. And then again, as Erlangers and Elixir, <laughs> we don't give a rat's ass about that. 
throw it at us. We have bit syntax for that. So, so then you start, yes, we can do this, and you can send commands, you could see the engines running and everything, and then, boom, Bluetooth issues. It turns out to be <coughs> latency when you're sending too much to the poor thing here. And then I did some experiments uh, with it, and because neither Jimmy nor I could figure out why it was doing this, you send a command to it, and you wait for the reply. This is very polite. This is like, you can't get any more polite. You wait for the reply. You're not in interrupting the other person. You're waiting for the other person to reply to you. This is common courtesy. And you do that a couple of times. Then after three or four of these interactions, the latency on the uh, thing went up to 250 milliseconds. So the algorithm you saw, making it following the line, we do it from this one over Bluetooth. This poor thing looks like it's been drinking for four days and then trying to follow a line. <laughs> it's, it's really horrible, and we will not do it to do you today. No, okay, good. Yeah. And then the hope here is that it might work over Wi-Fi. Uh, but then again, that then goes to show that Lego has been trying to open up this environment, but not fully. So, so you can buy a Wi-Fi dongle, but it has to be with one particular chipset and one particular model because the firmware has hard-coded into itself that it will only accept that chipset with that particular model number in it. Or you can recompile the firmware. And then again, I'm a little bit stuck on it because I need to find a Windows machine because you can only com configure this Wi-Fi dongle on a Windows machine. <laughs> no. Anyway, so you can go here, and Jimmy's here, but he's, he's the man on this one. He, he's done most of this uh, there. Uh, I'm the, I, I think I constitute the evil boss of the year award. I forced him to do Lego Mindstorm at work for three weeks. Uh, it doesn't get any more nasty than that, actually. Uh, there. But we have these two libraries uh, done here. And then uh, there's a small warning down here. Uh, don't, don't try to get the newest version of EV3 dev. Uh, I'll need to find out where to find the old one uh, there because the library, they changed the entire file structure uh, in the new version. This is open source, so you're allowed to do that uh, without telling anybody. Well, I could have read the page, but that's a little much uh, there. But anyway, there's something there. You can come, contribute, and if you update it to the new environment, we'll just get it merged in and everything. And if you're really enthusiastic, I might just give you access to just run the project, but uh, do have fun uh, there. And by the way, if you go out and buy uh, one of these Lego Mindstorm sets after this talk, that's happened after Elixir Conf, um, I'm not getting any uh, uh, returns from Lego for doing that, so there's no catches in this. It's, uh, yeah, it's clean. Now, then we come back to teaching programming. For this was all fun, and I can do this uh, there and there. So, so we take the normal visual environment um, from EV3, very, very difficult, also very, very Painful, and although I'm a, I'm a very uh, stern believer in pain-driven development, but not this kind of pain. This is the pain leading nowhere. Uh, there, and then we have this library we've now created for Elixir, which is better, but you have to learn Elixir first. So I'm still, in ha I'm still having my own set there at home, Christmas present, not going anywhere. So I need to fix that. So instead of just complaining about these things, I actually started this thing called Junior Beamster. Uh, there, where I'm teaching Elixir to 13 to 15-year-olds uh, at my son's school uh, there, and everything I do is made available freely on beamster.org uh, there, and I need to get the logo on the website as well uh, there, but anybody should be, if they're equally crazy as I am, just go out, take this material and ping-pong with me uh, and find ways to take this forward. Warnings, initial learnings from this, when you take these p kids when they're 18 months, they get a hold of a phone and they do something on it. Then they turn 13, 14. They come to my class and I say, command line. Huh. What's a command line? And you just, whoa. They have not been playing with computers and it's not their fault. They've just been brought up in this protective environment that doesn't subject him to pain like the rest of us with a VIC-20 or a Commodore 64 because the only thing you got there was a command line for starters and then you had to do something. Yes, that's what makes you a man or a woman. It doesn't matter. Uh, that's what it is. And then, so that was one thing. And then, of course, me being a Mac user, I could not explain to them how to open up the command line. So I had to, and then figured out that it's Windows plus R and then CMD and then you have the command line uh, there. Good. First problem solved. 
Then we go through that we install Atom on all the machines. And that is in, they install this editor. So you'd think that the logic is clear here. Good. Then say, now you open the editor and you start typing in a program. And then one of them opens up Word and starts typing in. It's like, no, 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 this is not going to work. You're not going to type in your program in Word. It's not going to help you much. So, so that's a different thing there uh, as well. But then they start getting it. And one thing I've seen is that functions, they're actually easy. They're easy to understand. It's just like mathematics uh, to them. Uh, there. So that, that's good. Recursion, on the other hand, yeah comes along a little more slowly uh, there. And then I have one thing that I want to do after the summer break, some UI, and find a way to do some sensible UI stuff uh, with Elixir. I'm looking at nitrogen and some of these things, just so they can get that kind of feedback in. But again, yeah, suggestions most welcome, so there. So anyway, so this gives you something, that that's some learning on, on Elixir and everything there. So then, sometimes, Walking can also make you think of other things uh, there. So what if um, you could start in a nice visual environment? Because there's something to learning and being in a visual environment. We, we cannot deny that uh, there. And then you would gradually open up the boxes. As you understand more, you can open up the boxes and see what's inside these boxes. And then staying with the same concepts, opening up more and more, and eventually you code everything in text in VI or Emacs uh, there, depending on how evil you are uh, uh, there. So, and then you start thinking, okay, maybe somebody else thought about this. And they actually did Scratch. They have this very intuitive, nice uh, environment uh, there, so that's good. The only problem is that uh, apart from the blocks are intuitive, so you can actually read what's going on here, it's, it's sequential programming. It's evil. It's not what we want to do. We need to do something further. And, and sequential is a little, sometimes important, but the little bit you do between sending messages. You see, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trained on Tony Horst CSP, so this is, this is how we should do it. So that's good for sequential. So then you've got another thing here. You have Elixir, which has these awesome uh, concepts for robots, because processes and message passing, they fit in 100%. How can we combine these things to give us something bigger? So. We take that each sensor actuator, just a process, the wires EQ communication, and you end up with this visual environment. And then the first thing you do is you give each of these elements a default behavior. Yeah, there's a reason why I'm into computer science and not uh, graphic design uh, there. But anyway, you open up the box and you can see the default code. So when people start putting in a sensor and connect it to something, there'll be a little default thing saying, oh, you have a color sensor here. Depending on what color you're reading, it'll turn on the engine to do this or that. And then that code will be showing in the box when they open it up. And then gradually they'll go from seeing the same concepts here, messages, wires showing where the messages are going, and then a little bit of code to do the transformations on it. It will be the same concept from day one to the day that they can just code uh, everything uh, there. And then we talk about learning curves. So you take a very, very simple visual environment, and that's probably the one where we had my father-son moment, well, mostly a father moment it turned out to be, uh, there, uh, yeah. is that you have, you hit the ceiling extremely fast, because when you do these things very simple, there are limits to what you can do. Then it just stops, and this is an issue, everybody's trying to do these things. You hit the ceiling very fast, and then it's not fun anymore. So you have fun for three months, and then whatever kit you have goes away. Then you can do the thing that goes doing today. You can take the complex visual environment, and then the le learning curve is insane. And I, I, I'll bet you, doing that is like programming C. You lose your hair. So don't do it. It's just not worth it. But then again, same concept from start to end should give you a smooth learning experience. And we also have to admit, playing around with Lego and getting robots to do stuff, it's fun. And it's what triggers people to do something. So that's something there. Uh, there. I just need somebody that can do the UI, then I shall do the e uh, um, Elixir programming and we can get that rolling. So the thinking here is basic concepts, processes, message passing, and the modeling is more or less straightforward. So that's the kind of nirvana we want to go to. And then remember here the uh, golden trinity of Erlang, or what the, the Beamster uh, church, the church the Beamster here is, share nothing with message passing, fail fast, and the failure handling. These are the things you need to embrace in your programming. 
and that's what's going to make good programs. It makes good programs on this one, and it also makes good programs when you're doing any, anything else in Elixir and Erlang. So that's it. Thank you. We have five minutes for questions. Five minutes for questions. It looks like I've, I've planned it. Good. Questions? Yes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, I've been involved in getting Erling running on those pies uh, there. So, you, what's your brick? Uh, brick pie. Brick pie. Okay. Good. Uh, I'll have a look at that. That could be really good to get that rolling. May, might make it easier. Uh, there. Well, pff, my solution there is that you get something like um, I want this kind of visual notation where I can see my processes being key building blocks and I also want my message passing to stand out and then I want to be able to again, so, so click on the boxes and then open up and see the handling, like the handle in for the handle event. That's the kind of code I want to see there. Little snippet where it's painfully obvious, you're getting this one in, what do you want to do about it? So you're breaking down these things step by step. So that's my thinking at this point. If it works, I don't know, it's a figment of my imagination. Uh, have, there. You, have you checked No Flow? Uh, because they have this kind of UI and, and uh, they're working on this kind of application. Yeah, but that's flow-based programming. No, unfortunately not. I had chosen a different track, and I, I am sorry. Yeah. 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 Maybe I can use that to get a, a shortcut on, on getting this rolling because that would be really cool. The UI should be general. It doesn't need to be for the programming underneath because it's quite much this. Well, anything I can steal, perfect. A no flow? It was a no flow. Yeah, no. Yeah. And that's. Yeah, and that's open source. Good. I think it's called Flow Hub, the actual UI. Okay, good. But then that's something there for, uh, for me to say. And also for others to collaborate with me. Because I, that's last time I checked, that's 24 hours also in my uh, day. So, uh, yeah, collaboration was good. Yeah, actually, I tried that when I was, uh, and, and uh, oh, the, okay, the video is still on, I'll say it anyway. I actually, in my youth, went to the dark side and I taught Java at the technical university. Uh, to my defense, I taught them recursion uh, there, just so they learned how to think a little uh, in that. Uh, and there, I didn't use the Russian dolls, I used the Towers of Hanoi. And then I had brought plates and things from the... Uh, the institute's kitchen, and then I was shuffling these things around and doing doing things. So th they they sort of got that one there. But I, I'll think about the Russian doll as well. But they're getting it slowly uh, there. But it's just yeah. But that yeah yeah yeah. Uh, one of the things, and I think I have to do more about it. One of the things I had success with was which not recursion was using pattern matching for Yatsi and detecting what scores you have. That they got very fast, a lot faster than I expected. So that was actually really good. But I'll try the Russian dolls uh, there and turn that into an exercise uh, there. More questions? I actually have one. Uh, does it exist on other robots? Uh, can we can it work? Uh, do you know if uh, we can work with Elixir on other kind of robots? On, like on not just the Lego, for example. The no, anything, anything you can run Erlang on, okay. you can put the Elixir on. So the Raspberry Pi works. Uh, I mean, the driver extra is very specific to the, the, that whole Linux thing and the whole okay. mumbo jumbo. There is very much directed, and it was directed at one particular version of EV3 Dev. Uh, there, and then th there needs to be some work on figuring out to be more resilient to changes in the way they represent things in the in the file system. Uh, there, but then again, 
I showed the macro there. It's not terrible what you have to do. You need to find a way, okay, I'm reading this file and I'm turning it into something sensible on my side and then you're gone uh, with it. It's the file structure that changes. That's what, yeah. yeah. No, no, they're just regular files in the, the Unix file system, uh, there, uh, or Linux. Yeah, but the, the, these seems totally straight uh, to me. But you need to close them every time you do something. Okay. Because when you, do, when you open up the run file, you need to write it down, and then it needs to be flushed and to the file before the, all the magic that happens inside that EV3 thing uh, detects it uh, there. But it's that works fast enough to see. You saw the line follower, so uh, there. I'm not sure how much speed we can give it, and then it'll still follow the line. But it works fast enough for that. So, yeah. Okay. That was the last question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.